The people versus the machines, from the dockers to the desk jockeys, is no one safe? Not everyone is happy about the rise of the robots. This week, we'll meet the people whose livelihoods are under threat. If the robots take over our job. And those who are doing something about it. Including people who might have thought that their jobs were safe. And we start with those who deal with the biggest things on water. This is how stuff moves around the world. Your car, your TV, your phone. They all arrive in a shipping container, one of millions each year stacked onto gargantuan ships and sailed from where they're made to where they're sold. Offloading these containers at ports across the globe is a complicated task as they're lifted from the ships, moved to the land, and then, when the right ride arrives, they're loaded onto lorries to be driven across the mainland. But at Europe's busiest port, Rotterdam, and its third busiest, Hamburg, something new is happening. Some of the cranes here don't have drivers. And some of the lorries don't have cabs. These are Europe's first robotic ports. So what we've got here is a mixture of remote control and completely autonomous machinery. And basically there are no humans in that middle bit at all. There's a very strict rule here. Human dock workers do their work outside the red line, and inside, everything is completely autonomous. Ports across the world perform this graceful ballet of stacking and unstacking. But at two terminals at Rotterdam and this one at Hamburg, it's a dance that humans aren't allowed to take part in. So what happens is there's a human controlling the crane that pulls the containers off the ship and then loads them onto this central platform. And then the human controlled crane goes and gets another container from the ship. Another crane comes along and pulls the container off that platform and loads it onto these trucks. That crane is autonomous. And so are the lorries. While the world is still waiting for the mythical self-driving car, these trucks are already making their way around the ports, transporting containers from crane to crane. Buried in the tarmac are thousands of little tiny transponders bleeping away, broadcasting special ID numbers. And that's how these trucks know where they are to within a few centimetres. And of course, that makes this a very simple environment to drive around, with a guide track taking them from A to B to C, and no unpredictable human hazards. They don't even need sensors to see what's around them. The only reason that they need humans in charge of the cranes on this side is because there are humans on the ship. And so the law says you can't let computers swing containers around where there are humans. So if there weren't people on the ship, the computers could control this crane as well. It's the same story at the other side of the port. The only thing the autonomous cranes aren't allowed to do is lower the containers onto the lorries because there are human drivers nearby. So that part is done by a human crane operator, but from an office nearby. I mean, it's all very impressive. It looks really cool. But there is a flip side to this, which is every one of those trucks that's driving around 10 years ago would have had a driver. And now it doesn't. And there are no crane operators. 
in the middle section either. So while we're looking at the future of work here, we really need to think about the future of the workforce too. And the workforce at Rotterdam has spoken. In 2016, 3,600 workers walked out to protest at increasing automation at the ports. Nick Stamm is the union official for ports. He says the dockers know that they can't fight automation, but he does warn that as fewer and fewer human workers earn wages, there'll be less money paid back to the state through income tax. So who's paying then, in the end, if the robots take over our jobs, who's then paying the tax? That's why I said it is time to discuss about robot tax. Then we still need roads, we still need trains, we still need schools, uh, hospitals. So somebody has to pick up the bill. So that uh, if we can uh, have an income, let's say for 20 hours working week, then we have also an, uh, a separated income from uh, uh, the social benefits paid by robots. I mean, if they don't like human beings anymore, that's fine, then we start fishing. But we want also an income. As a result of the strike in 2016, the Port Authority agreed not to cut jobs. And because the economy is buoyant at the moment, so far these workers are doing the same work in other terminals at the port. The Port of Rotterdam told us that although some jobs will be replaced by automation, that doesn't mean that there'll be less work. Instead, jobs will change or new jobs will be developed. Nick, though, is not convinced that everyone will want to retrain. We still need jobs for people who are low educated, but like to work, like to be a uh, comrade on the working place. I mean, nothing wrong with that. And the, all those bull in my eyes about long live learning systems and whatever, it's bull It's bull I mean, there are still people who didn't make it at school. They want to work with their hands. What's wrong with that? But this isn't the first time in history that manual labour has been automated. We sat down with leading academics to find out what we can learn from the past and what we can do better in the future. In the agricultural revolution of the 20th century, when tractors started to replace a lot of human labour on farms, we saw the introduction of universal high school education. So really, the impact that technology has on society is not predetermined. It's more or less entirely a function of how we choose to respond to technological change. I think over the next five to ten years we're going to see the job of cashiers disappearing for increasing numbers, we're going to see more bank tellers disappear, um, and we're going to see a lot of clerking and manufacturing jobs go as well. The impact on truck drivers is going to be quite significant. But it's not going to happen overnight. If you look at the mechanisation of agriculture, it took four decades for tractors to displace horses and agriculture uh, workers working in the fields. It's going to take at least a decade or two for it to play out, but the effects are going to be significant. I would argue that it's impossible to predict. It so much depends on the context in which the technology is used, how people use it, whether it's worth automating or not automating. There's already been uh, you know, an extraordinary change in the sort of work that's being done. I mean, we didn't have digital technology several decades ago, so we've seen you know, really new jobs. Um, but I think, strangely, these are probably the first jobs that will go. So, you know, it's last in, first out. Technology is transforming jobs in healthcare, in law, in finance, and it's not necessarily rendering those jobs obsolete, but it's changing them to a degree that the skills held by the workforce in those jobs five years ago is redundant. 
many of the new jobs that are being created in the service sector are very insecure and very low paid. There's not enough focus actually on what's happening now with work. Most artificial intelligence aren't intending to put humans out of a job. Um, these are tools to help us do things. We need people to be able to work alongside artificially intelligent systems to build a better workplace in the future. If we think about the National Health Service, the predictions suggest that we will be about 100,000 staff members short by 2027. If we look at the education system, we'll be about 50,000 teachers short at about the same time. So we need to think about how we might use artificial intelligence, not to replace people, but to help people work differently and more effectively, and actually probably more enjoyably. So if you take the job of a bank teller, right? What we see is that that job still exists. We have even have more bank tellers today than we had 10 years ago. But the job is an entirely different one, right? And the job of a bank teller of the 1980s and 70s is long gone, but we still kept the occupational title. There used to be amazing stonemasons, um, and that skill kind of got lost because building uh, changed. So we're just going to develop different and new skills. But if you look what's happened to workers who actually lost their jobs to automation, they are often downgraded in the process. They've taken jobs of lower pay subsequently, which means that they are net losers to the process of automation. And if a lot of people lose out to automation, they are likely to resist it. The livelihood of 900 workers has gone. It is the latest outrage by fanatics. the Industrial Revolution, of course, caused huge political change. We saw Marxism, socialism, capitalism exploiting the workers, the unions developing. Are we going to see a, a similar uh, political change with this new revolution? I mean, I wouldn't use the word revolution myself. I do think, of course, that the next phase of artificial intelligence will make huge changes. We'll reach an age where so much can be done by machines that we won't all need to work. Some countries are already beginning to think, what do we do in that situation? Do we create a universal income that everyone will have and they won't have to work? So it'll be a choice to work. A universal basic income is not going to address huge social support and companionship that is still central to people's identity by going to a workplace. I'm much more concerned about creating decent jobs. People that work are much happier than those who don't. Work is virtuous. We are very happy to work longer or extra hours to be able to buy new things. For many people, they're defined by their work. Uh, if you ask at a party, so what do you do? They're immediately asking you, what's your job? Um, so I think it is going to um, have a big psychological effect, um, this change. And I think it's going to be very fast. And next week, we'll carry on with the debate, and this time question how we adapt to the new world order. Do we rethink how we learn, work, and live life? Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that a woman in Arizona died after being hit by an Uber self-driving car. Uber have suspended trials in North America as a result. The Facebook data saga rumbled on with the social network's founder Mark Zuckerberg eventually speaking up on Wednesday. He admitted it had made mistakes that led to millions of Facebook users having their data exploited by Cambridge Analytica. And the 5G auctions have kicked off. The big four phone networks as well as another new player are bidding for their places within the 5G spectrum to give us that connection we've been dreaming of. Although most of us would be happy with our 4G working properly. 
Whilst there are serious questions over the safety of self-driving cars, MIT have announced it may have overcome the substantial issue of fog. Its system can apparently see through it better than the human eye, whilst also being able to gauge distance. And finally, Israeli researchers have been busy working on this robot arm. It should be able to pick apples, do a spot of DIY in outer space, play a pointless game and more. The um, catchily named minimally actuated serial robot developed at Ben Gurion University aims to be compact and cost effective. It uses just two motors, one moving in a straight line and one rotating to achieve a full range of movement. Like China, India is a country with a huge population and a relatively low-cost workforce of hundreds of millions. The country's education system produces millions of workers for India's IT industry, which provides the engine room for the world's software and computing needs. But now there's a problem. It turns out that a good deal of the work done by India's IT workers is surprisingly routine. And that's sucking an awful lot of jobs into the tractor beam of artificial intelligence. David Reed travelled to Pune in the central western state of Maharashtra to meet some of the workers who have been losing out. The IT human resource in India it is just a, it's not a human anymore. It's just a play, plug and play. You plug it, you use it, and you throw it. Ila, you set up this organization fight, a union shall we call it. What is it you're most angry about? Corporates were saying that automation and artificial intelligence, because of that, the jobs will lose. But there were a lot of illegal activities done by the corporates where uh, the employees were forced to resign and they were saying that we will backlist you if you're not resigning the job. If you can put on the papers... Last year, an audio recording emerged on social media in which a tech employee was given till 10 a.m. the next day to put in his papers or be fired without benefits. The company, Tech Mahindra, immediately apologized apologised, saying the incident ran counter to its core values. Do you think Tech Mahindra is, is treating people fairly? Absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, David, there will be always some time where we may go wrong. It's about recognising that if there is something that is wrong, to be able to raise your hand up and say, yes, I went wrong and I'm sorry for it. We are investing significantly in training them. We are investing significantly in giving them opportunity and most importantly, raising awareness that, guys, the world is changing. Automation is kind of un-Indian because labour is so cheap here, people often end up doing what elsewhere a machine like a printing press would do. But we are creative and imaginative. Maybe we're meant for more than this. You should be doing this creative work which is much better. That will eventually help us to reach to the next level of evolution of human being, which we are missing actually. We'll be doing something very exciting for sure. We should not bother about it. <laughs> Battersea Power Station. One of the UK's most ambitious restoration projects. At 42 acres, it's the largest construction site I've ever visited. And the race is on to complete the refurb of this Grade 2 listed landmark by 2020. There are 2,000 skilled contractors here working around the clock. Since work began five years ago, over 30 kilometres of scaffolding has gone in to rebuild the station's chimneys and painstakingly restore its 7.5 million bricks. You know, when you think about it, the construction industry is ripe for automation. It's dirty, it's dangerous, it's physical. A lot of it's quite repetitive. But then on the other side, can you imagine a robot navigating its way around a site like this? I mean, if it didn't fall over in the first 30 seconds, it wouldn't be able to pick any of these things up unless they were perfectly positioned in the first place. It's a robot nightmare. But one American company is trying to do just that. Meet Sam, or as he's formerly known, Semi-Automated Mason 100. He can lay 3,000 bricks per day. 
With no need for brakes and the ability to keep on working through the night, could this be the future of construction? Well, with only a few machines in existence and costing $400,000 each, probably not any time soon. And it's no surprise that some of the more interesting work to automate the construction industry is happening in San Francisco, where Dave Lee has been to find out more. Now look, don't tell anyone, but I've been trying to earn a few extra dollars, which is why some days you can find me down here on this construction site. There is a ton of work to be done, but you know what? I don't care, because it's the end of my shift. I'm really not cut out for the construction industry, but that's okay because thanks to companies like Built Robotics, maybe I don't have to be. Their autonomous system allows this hulking great thing to get to work without a human driver. It can be left alone to get on with the task at hand, which in this case is flattening out the land. It's fully autonomous. Um, and what that means is basically you load in plans uh, for what you want your finished product to look like, and then the machine uh, looks at the plans, figures out um, how to navigate around the site in order to accomplish the work, and then actually sends commands to the, uh, the onboard electronics uh, on each machine so that it can actually go out there and do the work. Noah is a former Google engineer, and he uses much of the same technology that can be found in that company's self-driving car. But he says his vehicle has to consider many more factors when going about its work. So it's a lot of a lot of nuance around how different types of soils interact with the blade, um, how the tracks spin uh, and slip as you you know move around a, a rough job site. Um, that's really the the hard part, and that's what we're focused on. It isn't just here on the ground in construction sites where autonomy is changing how things work. For a fuller picture, you need to look to the skies. One of the biggest challenges with construction, particularly big projects, is knowing what is going on and where. Skycatch, also based in San Francisco, has created what is essentially a foreman in the sky, a drone system that can analyse sites with incredible detail and share its findings almost immediately. It would normally take weeks to survey an area as big as this, costing money and, of course, time. Now, a detailed scan could be captured in just 15 minutes. These are becoming real tools now, right? Uh, before, we had cameras, we, we take video, photos. Now we can do real work with them. Uh, the technology we put inside these machines uh, can give you data that can be immediately act, um, used on the field. At any given point, construction sites are changing all the time. So, you know, you may know what's going on five minutes ago. Five minutes later, it's completely different. The success of this company is, of course, good news for companies that are trying to cash in on the increased automization of construction sites. But for the millions who make their living, a good living, getting stuck in on sites around the world, well, life is going to change. So, yes, the, the, the jobs will be reallocated. I think we'll we'll be spending more time on planning, on making sure things are done on time, uh, but it'll also have other really awesome effects. Buildings will be built in days. Um, will be a lot more affordable to build a highway. will be a lot more affordable to build a home. Um, so we believe that this will also help equalize how quickly people have access to homes. That was Dave Lee in San Francisco. And that's it from us here at Battersea Power Station. You can see more behind the scenes shots from this place and from the rest of the show on Twitter at BBC Click. And we live on Facebook too. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.